talk about today is the quantum mechanical model of the atom. Okay, so in your notes, there were two different models that I talked about. Niels Bohr had a model where he said the electrons are orbiting the nucleus, right? They're just going around and around and around following the same path. Well, that was all fine and good for hydrogen, but it didn't work for other elements with more than one electron. So a guy named Schrodinger came up with the quantum mechanical model of the atom. And what he said is that electrons don't have a specific path that they follow, they have a three-dimensional space in the atom where they exist. Okay? And that's what we're going to be talking about today are those three-dimensional spaces that he called orbitals. Okay? Now, an orbital um, is basically, like I said, a three-dimensional space in the atom. And we're going to be looking at the shapes of the orbitals and then we'll come back to these rules in just a second. Okay, so here are orbitals. This is in your notes. This picture came directly from the page before the one you're writing on. Okay. So an S orbital is a spherical shape. Okay. So what that means is the electrons in an S orbital can be anywhere within that sphere. The nucleus is in the middle. So electrons don't have to stay in one place. They can move around. The orbitals are just the spaces where they're most likely to be found. A P orbital has this kind of bow tie shape. And you have to think about them all being on top of each other with the nucleus in the middle. So the P orbital has this space, this space, and this space all put together. Okay? Then there's a D orbital. So those are all the D orbital shapes. And then there's also an S orbital, which is the very complicated shape that usually you don't see a picture of. So what we're going to do is we're going to follow these rules, okay, to assign electrons to the orbital, okay? You're going to need a periodic table in front of you because the periodic table tells us the order in which you fill orbitals. one of our rules 
Pauli exclusion principle says that electrons that occupy the same space have to be spinning in opposite directions, right? So in the 1s orbital, we can put two electrons, but they have to be spinning in opposite directions. So we show that with an up arrow and a down arrow to show their opposite spin. <coughs> so carbon's first two electrons are in the first energy level. They are in the s orbital, and they are spinning in opposite directions. That's what we just showed. S P E N. Yes. So you need to write them on your periodic table. Okay. All right. So the first shell only has an s orbital in it, and the s orbital is now full. So now we get to put electrons in the second shell. Okay. So now we are in the 2s orbital, and that orbital can also hold two electrons. How many electrons have we used so far? Four. Four, four right? Okay, so now let's come back over to the periodic table. So after we fill the 2s orbital, which is right here, okay, what else is in the second shell? No. What does this represent? What block is this? The P block. So what other orbital is in the second shell? A P orbital, right? Anyone remember what P orbitals look like? So in the first shell, there's one orbital. In the second shell, there are two orbitals, S and P. And <coughs> a P orbital um, has three different places for electrons. So it's going to get three little lines to represent two pairs. All right, now the third rule that you wrote down, Hun's rule, says that electrons have to um, go into the equal energy orbitals with the same spin before any of them can have opposite spins. So what that means is when we have a p orbital, all three of those spaces in the p orbital, remember there are three of them, one like this, one like this, one like that, they're all equal energy, and they all have to have one electron each before any of them can get two electrons, okay? So our last two electrons were both going to go up arrows, but in separate pairs, okay? They can't be paired up yet until all three spaces have one electron. so far? Maybe? Okay. All right, so this is an orbital notation. It shows the electrons in the orbitals. Okay, now we're going to simplify it a little bit and write out an electron configuration. And this is going to take what we just did and make it a little bit simpler. Okay, so instead of drawing the arrows, we're going to use a superscript to show how many electrons there are. So in the 1s orbital, there are two electrons. orbital, there are two electrons. The big number is the shell, and the superscript is how many electrons are in that orbital. The letter is the shape. Wait, the number is on the left. simplify it even further, okay? And to do that, we need to divide the electrons up into two categories, core electrons and valence electrons. And the valence electrons, in this case, are those. And then those are the core electrons, okay? So valence electrons are the electrons that are in the very outermost shell of an atom, okay? And they're important because when that atom enters with another <coughs> atom, it's the valence electrons that do the interacting. When we get to bonding, it's going to be all about valence electrons. The core electrons are all of the ones on the inside, okay? So we worry about the ones 
on the outside and then all the rest. Okay. Now, when we write the noble gas configuration, we can use a noble gas to represent the core electron. All right, so if we come over here, helium has the 1s2 electron configuration, right? That's why it has two electrons. So we can use helium to represent those two core electrons. So this is what it's going to look like. represent our core electron, and then we write out our valence electron. Now, for carbon, it's not really shortening anything, right? But when you get really long electron configurations, like when you get down and you have like 50 or 60 electrons, you bet this is really going to shorten the way you write it out, okay? Because you're only worried about those electrons. so far with carbon. You ready for the next example? Alright, let's talk about sulfur. Find sulfur. How many or how many total electrons does it have? Sixteen. It has sixteen. Okay, so the first thing we're going to start with is the orbital notation, right? Back to our periodic table. What orbital do we put electrons in first? The first cell. First cell. Second shell, P orbital. Okay, now this is where we do our up arrows first, then we go back and do our down arrows. Okay? So up arrows first, then down arrows. Alright, so now we've gotten 10 of our 16 electrons. We've filled up the second shell. Now what comes next? Third shell. 
The third shell, which orbital first? 3s. 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 Okay, we filled up 3s. Now which orbital are we going to fill up? 3p. 3p. And are we going to fill all of the 3p orbitals? No. How many electrons are in the 3p orbital? Uh, Look up there. Count. On the periodic table, how many four. in there? Before we get to sulfur, there's four, right? One, two, three, four. Four electrons in sulfur. So we put up arrow, up arrow, up arrow to force any of these arrows out of the box. The shell is the row. X orbitals hold two electrons, P orbitals hold six. Just what it is. Okay, you can count them across on the periodic table. So X holds two electrons in the shell. P holds six. We only need four because we've got the sulfur. Okay. Now, to simplify it, we break it down with our superscript. So we would write 1S2, not squared, 1S2. 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p4.
Fill up 4S, then we do 3D, then we go back to 4 and do 4D. Okay? So here for 3D, a D orbital can hold 10 electrons, so it gets 5 spaces. Okay? And just like the P orbital, you have to put one electron in each space before any of them get paired. This one we're only going to have.
will be exception to it. So it may refer to exception to the rule. But it only applies to the blue block. It only applies to things with zero definitions. Okay? So the first exception is chromium. to be 4s2, 3d4, right? Yeah, that's what we would expect, okay? Now, when we get to the d orbitals, half full and full orbitals are the most stable, okay? So what chromium does to become a little bit more stable is it takes an electron from the s orbital and it moves it over to half fill the d orbitals, okay? So instead of being 4s2, 3d4, it's actually 4s1, 3d5. That's the electron. So it would have one fill. Yeah. Yeah, so that would be the electron. Questions about the exception? Yeah. Uh, isn't it true though that all like the ones that aren't filled up all the way, they always want to give or take from uh, other, from elements, other elements, not within themselves. Oh, okay. so that's what happens in bonding. This is happening within the element itself. Oh, okay. okay. Uh, yeah, so that happens when things are bonding with each other. They're trying to fill up their Four 